roads. Where they're going, they don't need roads. In 1989, Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd reprise their iconic roles of Marty McFly and Doc Brown as they time travel their way onto the big screen in this explosive non-stop adventure sequel to Back to the Future. Literally picking up where the first movie left off, Doc and Marty travel to 2015 so Marty can save his children's future, where an elderly but menacing Biff steals the DeLorean to give his young 1955 self a sports almanac, which contains sport game results of the future so he can win bets and become rich and powerful. When Marty and Doc return to 1985, it's now a terrifying dystopian world where Biff has destroyed the town and turned it into a crime-ridden hellhole. The time-travelling duo must travel back to 1955 to get the almanac off Biff and to save the future. Where Back to the Future 2 literally invades Back to the Future 1, where Marty and Doc must also avoid bumping into their other selves. Back to the Future 2 is definitely the most action-packed in the series. From start to finish, there is always something happening which causes the next thing to happen. Boom, boom, boom. And it's definitely the most unique, as unlike the other two movies, it doesn't follow the stuck in time while trying to fix the DeLorean trope, but deals with other dilemmas of time travel, such as alternative realities. So buckle up as we look into 10 things that you didn't know about Back to the Future Part 2. I know CPR. Number 10, there wasn't meant to be a sequel. Despite the fact that the first Back to the Future movie ended on something of a cliffhanger, with Doc, Marty and Jennifer flying away in the DeLorean to embark on an adventure in 2015, there was never actually the intention to make sequels. Back to the Future writer and director team Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale have expressed that Back to the Future was meant to be a standalone movie, and the ending was meant to be more symbolic that Doc and Marty would go on to have plenty more adventures. They've also stated that if it was the plan all along to make a sequel, then they wouldn't have put Jennifer in the DeLorean, as they didn't really know what to do with her. That's why as soon as Back to the Future 2 starts, Doc pretty much knocks her out straight away with his sleep-inducing device. Even the excuse to bring Jennifer along in the movie is kind of half-baked, with Doc basically saying it's because she saw the DeLorean and he couldn't just leave her without an explanation, despite going on to put her in a sleep coma. Yeah, they really didn't know what to do with poor Jennifer. Number 9. Filmed back to back with Back to the Future Part 3. Back to the Future Part 2 pretty much started because there was a huge demand from fans who just wanted to know exactly what happened at the end of Back to the Future and the adventure that awaited Doc and Marty after the credits rolled. Zemeckis said that when you make a movie and it becomes a huge hit, it becomes like real estate and the pressure is then on to expand on it. So a deal was struck with Universal Pictures that was quite unique at the time to make Back to the Future Part 2 and 3 back to back at the same time. Yep, double the cinema tickets, double the bums on seats. The entire shoot of filming Back to the Future 2 and 3 took an entire year and Michael J. Fox said that so much happened in his life in that year, such as the death of his father and the birth of his son. So movie franchises have followed in making parts 2 and 3 back to back, such as The Matrix and The Pirates of the Caribbean. But it's a popular trend that pretty much started with Back to the Future. Of which Back to the Future Part 3 was released 6 months after Part 2. Number 8. Original Script Bob Gale started writing the script for Back to the Future Part 2 while Robert Zemeckis was directing Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and his initial script was a lot different to the final movie. Yes, the adventure starts in 2015, but unlike what we saw in the movie, Gale's original script saw Doc and Marty go back to 1967, as he thought it would be interesting to explore the 60s as the first movie explored the 50s. 
He said Marty's mum Lorraine was going to be a 1960s flower child and his father George was to be a college professor. And the setting was to explore the political issues of that era, such as the hippie movement and the Vietnam War. And there was supposedly a subplot where Marty gets arrested for not having a draft card. However, when Zemeckis joined Gale in the pre-production phase, they thought it'd be more fun to explore time paradoxes and have Marty and Doc travel to 1955 where the first movie takes place. Which I've got to admit, I always found really cool, how the movie enters that story while telling a completely new one. Number 7. Crispin Glover Lawsuit Yep, it's no secret that George McFly actor Crispin Glover has a love-hate relationship with the Back to the Future brand, and his feud with its writer Bob Gale is probably the most controversial element of the franchise. Basically, Crispin Glover didn't return to the sequel, which led to the subplot of his character being killed off in the alternative 1985. In the past, it's been stated that Glover didn't return because of a pay dispute, whereas Glover has since said that it was over a disagreement while making the first movie, as he didn't like the ending and how Marty was rewarded with wealth and luxury, like now having that truck, whereas he felt that love should have been the reward, and that that dispute just rubs Zemeckis and Gale the wrong way. However, to overcome the lack of Glover in Back to the Future Part 2, a different actor was used who wore moulds of Crispin Glover's face that were made for the first movie. Yep, the actor quite literally wore Glover's face. And to hide even more that this wasn't Glover, the actor was even filmed upside down. This infuriated Glover who sued the production for illegal use of his likeness, which even led to a new role in the Screen Actors Guild. Glover has stated that he disliked the other actor's performance and that it really upsets him that people actually thought it was him performing in Back to the Future Part 2. There is even a very recent interview that Glover has given where he talks about the ordeal and still 30 years later he seems really upset and outraged over what happened. I hope that one day he and Bob Gale can make peace so the ill feeling between the two won't be looming over the franchise. Number 6 Hoverboard Urban Legend One thing that everyone remembers about Back to the Future Part 2 was them awesome hoverboards. And just like every other kid, after watching the movie, I really wanted a hoverboard. Like, as in real bad. What didn't help is the fact that Zemeckis gave an interview while on the set of Back to the Future Part 2, where he said that hoverboards were real toys, but they got banned when parent groups complained that they weren't safe, so they were all recalled from stores, and that he managed to get his hands on a heap of the recalled hoverboards from warehouses to use for the movie. This made us kids lose our freaking minds! I mean, think about it, the prospect of real-life hoverboards existing? And the infamous interview led to an urban legend that hoverboards are indeed real. However, Zemeckis made up the story. You know, it was sort of a prank. I guess you could say that he was trolling before trolling was a thing. How does it even work? And looking back at it, it's silly that us kids fell for it because all you had to do was look at the behind the scenes footage to see that the hoverboard effect was created via wires and trick photography. Number 5. Pizza Hut Promotion Not only does Pizza Hut feature in Back to the Future Part 2 in the form of hydrated pizza, but Pizza Hut also had some Back to the Future tie-in merch, where they were selling Back to the Future sunglasses, done in the style of the shades seen in the movie's version of 2015. Personally, I was always disappointed we didn't get Doc's silver visor eyewear. Despite the fact that the shades look cringy now, back in the day everyone was wearing these, well at least in my school they were, simply because they had the Back to the Future name attached to them. The ads were interesting too, as we see these two guys from 1989 Hill Valley just casually jump into the DeLorean and travel to 2015. Who are these guys? How do they know about the DeLorean? And how to use it? Who knows? But what's interesting is that one of the adverts is filmed on the 2015 Hill Valley set, featuring many of the props used in the movie. And it's just interesting seeing shots and parts of the set that weren't featured in the film. Along with the fact that it was filmed at night, as once again the movie we only see the set during the day, and seeing it at night makes it look quite different. Number 4. Children could get their very own DeLorean. Not only was Pizza Hut getting in on the 1.21 gigawatts action, but so were Toys R Us. Yeah, 
Remember Toys R Us? That chain of awesome toy stores that had a giraffe as a mascot and one of the stores was supposedly haunted until the company closed down? Well, Toys R Us sold kids their very own DeLorean that they could fit into and get around in. Yep, and going by this advertisement, these things look pretty badass. And like they can indeed take you to the future. I mean, just look at this kid. He's loving life so much, he doesn't care that the toy car that he is sitting in is on fire. However, notice in the ad that the DeLorean is a drawing illustration. Well, sadly, that's because when you see it for real, I don't know, just to me it doesn't look very impressive. But either way, I'm sure that if you were a kid in 1989, then driving around in this would have been awesome. Number 3, Hill Valley 2015 was anti-Blade Runner. Another thing that sticks out in people's minds in regards to Back to the Future Part 2 and the Back to the Future franchise in general is the awesome 2015 we see, where the world looks bright and colourful and cheery, not to mention the fact that it's playing Jaws 19. Like everyone else, when watching Back to the Future Part 2, I was excited for the future and all the possibilities that it would bring. When it came to designing the future Hill Valley, Gale and Zemeckis wanted to avoid what was seen in Blade Runner, which at the time was the most famous and well-known futuristic setting in a movie. A future world that was dark, dirty and polluted. So the two filmmakers went for the exact opposite. Rather than making a dark, scary world, they made a bright and colourful future that was an optimistic and happy place in order to avoid comparisons of the two cinematic futures. And the 2015 of Hill Valley is full of pop cultural references. There are several nods to Jaws, a Who Framed Roger Rabbit doll, laser discs, and interestingly, VHS copies of Dragnet and Animal House. Basically, the 2015 of Back to the Future just looked like an awesome place that everyone wanted to go to. Number two, deleted scenes. Back to the Future Part 2 had a series of deleted scenes removed that actually would have made Back to the Future Part 2 a darker movie. Making me wonder if originally Zemeckis and Gale were intending to give it an Empire Strikes Back and Temple of Doom treatment, in that both those sequels are darker and more haunting in tone. One scene involves Biff being wiped from existence upon his return to 2015. Yeah, we actually see the character die. It has been suggested that the alcoholic Lorraine of the alternative 1985 couldn't handle Biff's abuse anymore, so at some stage she killed him. There's another scene where Marty looks over his high school in the alternative 1985 to see that it's been destroyed and is burning in ruins. And finally a scene where Marty actually bumps into his brother Dave, who is now a drunken mess. The part of Dave was played by Mark McClure, who played Jimmy Olsen in the Superman movies and Dave McFly in Back to the Future 1 and 3. However, his part in the second entry was entirely cut. Also, remember when Marty visits the Biff Tannen Museum, where a TV is showing the highlights of Biff's life, and we see a picture of Buford Mad Dog Tannen? Notice how this looks nothing like the Buford we finally see in Back to the Future Part 3? Well, this is because that photo was used from a makeup test for the character as when this part of Back to the Future Part 2 was filmed, they hadn't yet settled for the final Buford look they eventually went with. Number 1. Third Highest Grossing Movie of 1989 Of course, Back to the Future Part 2 was one of the most anticipated movies of 1989 and made $332 million on the box office on a $40 million budget. So it was a huge hit. It was the highest grossing Thanksgiving release of that time, beating Rocky IV's record, and the sixth highest grossing movie of America in 1989 and third internationally highest grossing movie, trailing behind Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and Batman. And the film got pretty good reviews too. Although it was felt that it wasn't as good as the original, Part 2's manic energy and escapism was still enjoyable. The film's box office numbers weren't quite as high as the originals, but in 1989 there was a lot of competition, even competing against fellow second installment Ghostbusters 2. But it was Batman who was dominating the cinemas in that summer. So considering all this, Back to the Future Part 2's box office performance is still very impressive. Say what you want to say about Back to the Future Part 2, it at least tries something different, which itself deserves praise. 
If part one is a comedy and part three is a character drama, then consider part two the action movie. From the movie start to finish, you're on the edge of your seat in this crazy, out of this world adventure. And no joke, Back to the Future 2 is my favourite instalment in the series. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I think he took his wallet. See ya!